you help me welcome our Oconomowoc launch team to the stage this morning? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, while they're getting their places, let me say that uh, I just want to encourage you what the video said as far as that video can be found on our Facebook page and website. Uh, please share it. If you have social media, please share it. Share it multiple times between over the next three weeks. Uh, that is way more effective of advertising and marketing than us uh, spending a lot of money on a direct mail piece or something like that. So if you would do that, uh, that will help us. Uh, you can be seated for now. Those are still standing. Acts chapter 13, uh, verse 2 and th through 4 says, One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work that I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Now that is what we want to do today for our Walk team. We have been planning for this day. We have been praying for this day. We have been fasting for this day. And people on this team have a special work to which God has called them to. Uh, so this is the verbiage that we use and this is the heart that I have. We are not, there, there are many people up on the stage that I'm very close to and I am going to miss seeing on a weekly basis. On, uh, I'm gonna miss seeing on Sunday. But here's the truth. Like, we're not losing them, we're sending them. There's a big difference between those two. And I, I liken it to when I took, uh, Michelle and I took our oldest son, Carson, to school, uh, in that it was a sad day, right? It was sad because we weren't going to see him every day. But there was also an excitement that, man, we're launching you into your future. And, and I feel that way, though some of these people are older than me. Two of these people are older than me. <laughs> But I do feel, so it is more appropriate like they're my kids. I, I'm sending them out, and we're sending them out. So would you join me in standing and just stretch your hand this way, and let's pray uh, for this team this morning. Father, I just thank you once again, Lord, for your goodness and for your grace. I thank you for those in this team that will be uh, shaking hands every week and welcoming uh, guests to the campus. I thank you for those that will be on the worship team or working with babies and children, and, uh, those that will be setting up and those that will be setting, tearing down or serving coffee. Lord, in any numerous jobs in between, God, we pray for each of those roles, God, that you would help them to see I'm not just uh, changing a diaper, I'm helping a family connect with God. I'm not just serving a cup of coffee. I'm helping a family. I'm helping an individual connect with others and with God. I'm not just setting up. I'm, I'm setting an atmosphere where people are going to connect with God, that people's lives are going to be changed and families are going to be transformed. I have a role that God has placed with me. It's a special work that God has called me to. And so, God, we just pray for them. We pray your anointing upon them. Uh, and, God, we just pray as they represent us in Oconomowoc, as they represent you in Oconomowoc, God, I pray that you would bless them, anoint them for the task. And, God, we celebrate in advance the lives that will be transformed. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much. Now. Now, something else uh, I want you to notice is how many people are up here, and this isn't all of them, but uh, that is going to create a few empty seats, uh, a few empty spaces in serving here and a few empty seats. And so uh, we are intentionally not ratcheting back to two services. We're staying at three services because I want the pressure uh, for you and for me to practice neighboring. The more we practice neighboring, we're going to fill some seats. I believe that with all my heart. And so I'm excited about it and we're uh, enthused about it. But every empty seat is an opportunity for someone to fill it. And that could be, I believe, will be your neighbor. So before I let them leave the stage, we're gonna do one more thing together this morning and that is we're going to keep them up here for communion. Uh, we're, our ushers are gonna come and serve us for communion. Uh, Tyler and I are gonna serve them. And we just want to do this together because it's representative when, when Jesus served communion, uh, at the Last Supper, he was doing it with his disciples, recognizing this is the last time we're going to, in this way, celebrate this together. 
And they set this as an example for you and I uh, of the picture of unity. And we are one church in two locations starting next week. And I think communion is a beautiful way to celebrate that. Now, at Bridge Church, we practice open communion. You don't have to be a member of this church. If you love Jesus, follow Jesus, you can practice with us uh, and receive the elements, but hold them together until everybody's been served at the end. All right. Our ushers, if you would come and serve us, and Tyler and I will get ready as well. chapter 26 beginning, beginning with verse 26 as they were eating Jesus took some bread and he blessed it then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying take this and eat it for this is my body I've asked Pastor Tyler to lead us in prayer for that this morning Father we thank you for the broken body of your son Jesus Christ God, it's in this moment that we just choose to remember that you suffered in our place, you suffered on our behalf, and you were broken for us. And all we can do is come in humility and say thank you for that suffering that you endured. And say thank you that you're with us in every broken place of our life because you were broken before us. And so thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may receive the bread together today. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Pastor Tyler, would you pray? And Jesus, we take a moment to remember your spilled blood poured out for us. And we acknowledge that it's only by your blood that we are set free. And it's only by your blood that our debt of sin is wiped clean. And so as a body of people, free and clean and with our debt completely wiped away, Again, we just say thank you. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may receive the cup this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for being willing to go. We appreciate it. God bless you. One of the key components that has made this campus launch possible was a new giving initiative that we started uh, in 2018, midway through the year, called Kingdom Builders. Kingdom Builders supports is, is the way that we give, which supports four things. 
So all the money given to Kingdom Builders only goes to one of these four things. Uh, global missions, home missions, means U.S.-based missions, uh, local expansion, and future Christian leaders. And so in addition to what uh, individuals have given this year, we decided as a board, as a church, that we are going to tie that of our general fund to Kingdom Builders because we desperately want to remember and to practice that it is about others. Uh, we don't want to be focused on us. We want to be focused on others. Um, and so part of what Kingdom Builders enabled us to do in 2018 was we gave monthly support to 35 missionaries and ministries. Uh, we gave $35,000 to Speed the Light to purchase the winnings of vehicle, which we celebrated last week. Uh, our children gave over $2,500 to BGMC to help missionaries have materials to be able to support their ministry with. Uh, we gave money to Feed One to make sure that the kids that are near the church that we helped in Haiti, uh, two different missions trips over the last three years, that they are fed daily. Uh, we were able to purchase all the equipment necessary to launch our campus in Oconomowoc. We funded all of our outreach events this year. Uh, we were able to give a scholarship to every student that applied that's in a school training for full-time ministry and, and more. Uh, but that was last year. 2019 is a new year, and we have some new things that we want to help fund this year. Uh, among them are a, Cur a Cuba church plant. Uh, so I, I went to Cuba a few, a uh, couple months ago now, and about five years ago, we paid for a house in Cuba. If, you're, if you were here at that time, we, we, planted a, we bought a house so that they could turn it into a church. Uh, churches have no rights in Cuba to buy any property. So you can't just say, hey, I'm going to start a church. I'm going to buy that building. You have no right to do that. But you can buy a house and they're in, they are able to plant a church out of the house and then they can build onto the property at where the house is and have a church. That you can do. And so we did that about five years ago. When I was in Cuba two months ago, I got to speak, not at that one, but at a house church. And at that house church, there was a hundred plus worshipers there and but that's how church planting happens in Cuba and so for less than ten thousand dollars this year we will buy another house and then in 2020 we're going to take a missions team uh, to that house and begin to help them expand it into a church that's our goal and that's our, our dream for that so that's one of the projects we're, uh, we got a team going to Jamaica we're sending some project money with them uh, we have our former youth pastors Brian and Carolyn Dunn uh, that were here years ago they're planting a church in Stockholm Sweden and we're going to help them do that. We're going to support some local uh, foster care and adoption ministries. And one dream that we have that we'd love for you to pray with us about uh, and that we're working on. We've already had some conversations towards this. We have a dream to put a, put a live stream, to put live stream equipment into the county jail uh, so that we would have, yeah, amen, which would enable us to have another campus. And I would love that campus to be able to hear the gospel every week, to be able to experience worship. Uh, there we wouldn't have a live worship team, <laughs> but we would, have, uh, we would be able to stream our, our worship live there. And I would, that would be a dream come true. So we're working on that. Uh, mission trip scholarships. We want every junior and senior that wants to go to El Salvador this year, the church is going to give them a scholarship towards that, a pretty significant one. And we want to do that every other year so that every student that wants to go on a mission trip, we can at least help to get there because we believe that life change really happens on mission trips. Uh, Kingdom Builders is going to fund the entire first year of expenses for our Commonwealth campus. And there are several other things that are outlined in the brochure that's sitting on your seat. Now, we want to invite you to participate uh, in one of these ways. You can step in. You've never given to Kingdom Builders before. Maybe you're new. Maybe you just didn't do it last year. We just want to invite you. Step in. Just do something. Uh, begin giving. Step two, maybe it's to step up to, new, to a new level of generosity. Uh, number three is just to step out in faith. Take a step of faith and do it and see what God does through your giving this year. Uh, we are not heavy-handed with giving at all, but we believe that it's an opportunity because we're excited when we get to give money away like this. We get to do things that make an impact for God's kingdom. It excites us. It gives us joy. And so we're excited to do that. Acts 11.29 says, The Christians agreed that each one should give what money he could to help. And so we just believe that's something God's calling us to. So if you know what you want to give already, you can fill out 
Uh, you can fill out the top portion of the card. You tear it into two. You keep the small one as just a reminder for yourself. And the other part at the end of service, you can place it in this box. Uh, or there's a drop slot out in the foyer located by the ladies' restroom. Uh, you can turn it into that in that way. Now, I want to thank you in advance because I believe there's going to be a tremendous return on, the, on your kingdom investment. And I want to invite you just to hold that card up in your hand. Even if you're not going to be able to give anything, I just want you to hold the card in your hand as we pray this morning. God, we thank you that each card represents, Lord, the uh, fuel for life change, Lord, in 2019. And God, we just pray that you would lead and direct each person as to what you want them to do. And we give you thanks in advance for what, Lord, giving to Kingdom Builders is going to do for your kingdom this year. And God, we just pray for that. We pray this morning in this service, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts in ways that only you can do through this message and that you would inspire us and challenge us to obey what you call us to do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for your patience for a little extra stuff this morning. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, she was already going to be leading today, but Bradley woke up in the middle of the night with the flu, and so you can keep him in prayer uh, today. Now, turn to your neighbor this morning, look him square in the eye, and with your best Mr. Rogers impression, say, won't you be my neighbor? Now, as we, as we launch this theme at the beginning of January, we launch this theme, neighboring. We choose a theme word every year. Uh, I cast the vision from the story of the Good Samaritan uh, that we become intentional. And one of the ways that we practice neighboring is with our literal neighbors, uh, that we start by getting to know their names. And so we pass out some cards that, that look like this. And in fact, there's more in the foyer if you weren't here or if you need another one. But we encourage you, that's your house in the middle, and try to get to know your neighbor's names and write them in those squares. Uh, we still have, I think, two squares open. Uh, we've learned one more uh, than we already knew, but we're still working on that, and hopefully you are too. In fact, if any of you, if you have learned at least one neighbor's name since we launched the series, would you raise your hand? All right. All right. The reason for that is I want to shame the rest of you. I'm just going to, we are going to, I think we're probably, this card will get a nickname as the card of shame because I am going to bring it back up multiple times this year. Uh, why? Because we believe in this neighboring theme and I want to continue to encourage you and to challenge you to do it. Just do it. Just learn. Now, I understand it's winter and it's like 130 degrees below zero outside, so maybe not as tempted to get out and go do that right now. I get that, all right? Uh, but I want to continue to encourage you. Uh, if you missed any of the messages from the last two weeks, we talked about time and fear being big obstacles for us uh, obeying this command. But I want to encourage you to go back and, and check those out. Uh, but I want to wrap up this first series of the year by talking about what does it take, what does it look like to be a neighbor. And we're going to discover some principles from a story in the book of John. Now, before I read our text, I want to share, like, why is this important? And I found this, like, modern-day example uh, to me, that displays why this is so incredibly important. Uh, Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world by population. Uh, we have uh, China and India and the United States uh, are above them, but Indonesia is the fourth largest by population. Now, what you may not know about Indonesia, if you know anything about Indonesia, you may not know that they, in their constitution, have religious freedom which is actually fairly unusual for that part of the world. But they have religious freedom for, uh, they have six approved, uh, recognized religions officially. Islam, uh, Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism uh, are all approved. Now, Christian and Muslim missionaries both showed up in Indonesia about the same time, 125 years ago. Uh, the Christians did many, many good things. They built schools and medical clinics and schools or in, in churches. Uh, but they, they built almost all of these inside of walled compounds uh, for safety reasons and stuff. They built them inside of walled compounds. In contrast, the Muslims simply moved into the neighborhoods. They became part of the social fabric of the community. The Christians had a compound mentality the Muslims had a neighborhood mentality, 
And today, Indonesia is 85% Muslim. And it's number 30 in the, in the list of the most dangerous countries in the world for Christians to live and operate in. It's the 30th most dangerous place for Christians to operate. Why? One practiced neighborhood, one practiced neighboring, and one didn't. One built up walls and said, we gotta be safe, we gotta be safe. It's important. Neighboring is that important because Jesus said that it was that important. In Matthew 22, which you read this week, if you're following our Bible reading plan, the religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus with various questions. And their last attempt was to ask him which of God's commandments was the greatest. And interestingly, uh, he wasn't able to answer that question with just one commandment. He answered that question with two. He said it this way, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment period. Now, if it stopped there, you'd be like, that makes sense that that would be the first, it's the greatest. But then he continued, um, a second is equally important, meaning it's, what does equally important mean? It means it's equally important. just wanted to see how, uh, how you'd change that. It's, it just means it's as important. So if it's the first one's the greatest commandment, this is greatest commandment part two. It's still the greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. And then a little bit later, uh, the Apostle Paul, a few, you know, a few years later, he expounds on that. He actually narrows it from two to one. And it's not the one that you think. He says in Galatians 5, 14, you obey the entire law, the whole law, when you do this one thing. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, here's what he's saying, in my opinion. How you treat your neighbors is how you love God. That's how it's demonstrated. He's not, he's not saying don't love God, obviously. He is God. No, he's saying this is how... This is the way that you demonstrate that. If you want a barometer on how you're doing at loving God, all we have to do is how you're treating your neighbors. How's that feel? How you doing with that? Matthew 25, 34, 34 through 46 tells of the final judgment. Jesus is telling an example of what's going to happen in the final judgment. And he says, and then the, the king will say to some, come, you who are blessed by my father, for I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then he turns to another group, and he says, Depart from me, you who are cursed by my father, because I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me drink. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was in prison, and you didn't visit me. And then both parties reply, in the same way, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison and do these things or not do these things, depending upon what group? And his answer tells us how important it is to love our neighbors. He said, I tell you the truth, when you helped or you refused to help, the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. He was equating how we treat, hear this, the least with how we love him the most. He was equating how we treat the least. And here's what I want you to remember from today's message. Our love for God is incomplete without loving our neighbor. Our love for God is incomplete without loving our neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. They're like, they're like two hinges on a door, a normal door has at least two hinges, right? A, a normal door with one small hinge, it's not functional. You need at least the two hinges and then it can swing uh, freely. And the same is true here. I think loving God is the top hinge and loving our neighbors is the bottom hinge and they work together. together. And Jesus said everything depends on both of these. They cannot be separated. He said all the law and the prophets hang like a hinge. They hangs on these two commandments. Our love for God is incomplete without loving our neighbor. Now, it doesn't just apply 
to our literal neighbors, right? But it does apply to our literal neighbors. And so we're challenging you to start there. And I want to flesh this idea by, out by looking at a story in the Gospel of John of what took place when one person's life was transformed and how that impacted their neighborhood and maybe part that you hadn't considered before, because I certainly hadn't, was how it impacted the disciples. All right. Now, I believe this interaction with, it, with this individual was intended to teach the disciples this lesson, that our love for God is incomplete without loving our neighbor. John chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, you're more than welcome to turn there. I'm going to kind of condense part of the story, and then we're going to read part of the story. But John 4 tells the story of a Samaritan woman who was getting water from the local well around noon, and the disciples had gone into the village of Sychar. Uh, Jesus strikes up a conversation with her, and he asks her for a drink of water, which was rather scandalous. Uh, one, because she was a woman. Two, because she was a Samaritan woman. Uh, so they were enemies. They were people that didn't like the Jews, and the Jews didn't like them. And so it was very scandalous that he would ask this. And in Jesus' conversation, he, he discovers some things about her. Uh, well, he revealed them. He already knew them, but he revealed them to us. And one was that she had been married and divorced five times. And that he, she was now living with a man uh, who was not her husband. And so that, we, we find out from that, this is the reason, like maybe scholars believe that's the reason that she was getting water in the middle of the day. Because that's the hot part of the day in a desert climate. That's not usually when people would go and get water. Uh, they would go in the first of the day, in the early part of the day. And that's when all the ladies from the village would have been there. Uh, she went in a different part of the day because she was trying to avoid them. Don't you think she was kind of the talk of the town? And, uh, you know, oh, we remember you because you stole my, you know, you stole my girlfriend's husband. Or I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. I don't know how that looked. But in some way, she was like the ostracized person, uh, person that in the neighborhood or in the village. And so we, we find out this is probably the reason why she's here at the hot of the day. Now, during their conversation, uh, Jesus crossed social, gender, and religious barriers. Uh, he used natural conversation to talk about spiritual topics. You know, she's there getting water, and he starts talking about living water. Uh, he focused on her life. And then lastly, he, would, he pointed towards himself as the one that could fulfill everything she wanted. Now, let me read part of the story. Right after Jesus tells her that you've been married five times, divorced five times, the man that you're living with now is not your husband, as soon as he said that, she says, sir, you must be a prophet. Like, I love that part. Like, duh. Yeah, you just told me everything I needed to know. So, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while we Samaritans claim that it's here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? Uh, Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Uh, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes from the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Hear this. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Mouth drop. I mean, can you imagine her response in that moment? Like, what? We don't know what her response was. Other than this, we know that she believed him. Because the fruit and all the things that she does after that tells us that she believed him. And I want you to think about this, because I hadn't before. The disciples who had been with Jesus, they had seen his miracles, they had heard his teachings, they then returned from town. I want you to think about that. He had sent them into town. And they went into town, and the Bible does not record that they had any conversations with anyone in Sychar, that they had made any impact whatsoever, that they had shared in any kind of way. They just simply went there, got their supplies, and came back. But I want you to notice what happened in her life. 
The woman left her water jar beside the well, and she ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. So this woman with a mixed up theology and a messed up life helped lead hundreds, helped introduce hundreds, maybe even thousands of her neighbors to Christ. And the question I had when I was reading this was why was God able to use her and not the disciples? And I came up with four reasons. Number one, she knew her neighbors and was known by her neighbors. That was really important. Um, she was not known for good things, right? At this point, she wasn't known for good reasons. They knew her because she was rather immoral by their view, that she was very immoral or loose. And, and so they knew her. They were, they were aware of her. They knew her name. And I want to encourage you here that God is able to use you, even if you're known for bad reasons right now among other people. Like God can use you when God transforms your life like, you have a powerful story. Like, this woman, not known for good reasons. She was known for only bad reasons. But God used her in a powerful way. And part of the reason was because she had been known for bad reasons before. Right? Anytime they came near her, I'm assuming her eyes kind of dropped, you know, in shame. She knew what she did. They knew what she did. And so she wasn't proud of that. And so she just had to walk in shame. This time she runs back to the village and she's looking them square in the eye. And she's like, this guy told me everything there is to know about me. Come and see him. Come and meet him. Man. Could this be the Messiah? She was transformed. And partly because of the bad past, she had a powerful testimony to say, that they could go, man, something's changed her. Let's go check it out, <laughs> right? So they ran. I think the second reason that comes to mind for me is that she opened her eyes to her neighbors, that she saw them with eyes of grace. Because don't think for a second that in her physical, uh, in her flesh, that she forgot that they avoided her, that they looked down on her, that they all knew this bad part of her. Physically, fleshly, she didn't forget any of that. But when she experienced grace, when she experienced the love of God, she desperately wanted them to see and experience what she had seen and experienced. And so she ran back to people that had ostracized her and hated her and said, come, come see a guy. Now, third reason, I think, is that she told her story. She didn't memorize some script. She didn't have the spiritual laws or the Romans road or any way, other, other way memorized. All, I mean, think about how briefly she had, it had been since she had met Christ. All she knew was he's the Messiah, right? She just knew that what he had done in her life. And so now she's just saying, come and see a man. I'm like, I got nothing I can tell you. I can't explain everything there is, but I can just tell you this much. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Would you just come, come and see? And her last thing is she asked her, question, her neighbors a thoughtful question. Could it be? Could he be the Messiah? Again, she didn't come to preach at them. She came simply to share her story, what had happened to her. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. This is what happens when the people came out. So he stayed for two days. Long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Now, I, I don't know how many times I've read this story in the Gospels. Don't have a clue. Dozens of times I've read this story for sure. And there's a part of it that I, it's like I've seen before, but I've never really contemplated it before. I've never really thought about it before. And I want you to, uh, and hopefully you get as much out of it as I did. The part is, they begged him to stay in their village, so he stayed for two days. I want you to think about that. I don't think he did that just for the woman, probably not, maybe even hardly at all, for the woman that he met at the well. I think he did it for the people in the village. But I also think he did it for the disciples. There's this part of the story as it's being introduced that said he had to go through Samaria. 
And I think he had to go through Samaria for multiple reasons, but at least two of them are. He had an appointment with a woman at a well. I think he did have an appointment with a village. But a, a third reason, I think, and I hope it's powerful for, for you today, is for his disciples. I think he wanted them to experience everything they were about to experience in the village of their enemy by spending two days with them, that these were people to be loved that these were people, that they weren't just our enemy in name, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you live with them for two days. And if you can't wrap your mind around that, I want you to think about if there was somebody, uh, if there was somebody here this morning and they came with full intention, they're like, a, let's say they're an extreme terrorist and they came this morning because they were gonna take you out and your family out and your church out and then they, they meet Jesus today, and then tonight they invite you over to the house for a couple days to get to know each other. And if you went, you'd be sleeping with one eye open, hoping they didn't backslide that night. <laughs> right? If you, if you remember the story when some uh, missionaries spent the night with Michelle and her family uh, when she was a kid. They had been former cannibals before they had gotten saved. And Michelle's parents, people of faith and power, had Michelle spend the night in their room just in case, just in case these men and women of God backslid and didn't have a little Michelle for dessert or in the middle of the night. I don't know. We were very human, aren't we? And so imagine, though, that that's, the, that's what took place. That is what took place here. Enemies of the Jewish disciples people they would have considered enemies, now they're sleeping in Samaritan houses and beds. Now they're eating at a Samaritan table and they're learning what it looks like through the eyes of Jesus to love their neighbor, even when it's an enemy. Now, it reminds me of the lesson that he taught in Luke chapter 6. Uh, verse 32 through 35, Jesus said, If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? I love that phrasing. Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit for that? Now I want you to see that he phrases this in the negative, right? If you only do this, like why should you get credit for that? Now for you to understand and for me to understand the full power of these words, I'm going to change it into the positive. All right? And first, uh, let me read the last part of that. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be truly or very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Now, to get the full meaning, the word credit is the Greek word charis. And if you've ever heard that Greek word before, you've probably heard it in the context of the way that it's usually translated, which is grace. And to understand what he's saying, again, I want to put it in the positive. So hear this. If you love those who don't love you, you will receive grace for that. Because basically what he was saying before, if you love only those who love you, why should you get grace for that? Like you're doing it in your own strength. You don't need grace for that. But when he when we think about it the way that he intended it, if you love those who don't love you, like, I'm going to give you grace for that. And if you do good to those who are not good to you, you will get grace for that. And if you lend to those from whom you don't expect repayment, you will receive grace for that. So this entire idea of neighboring, uh, you're not being asked to reach out and to love your neighbors in your own strength. You're being asked to, will you take a step? Because when you take a step, Jesus says, I've got some grace for that. If you just reach out and do it, if you just begin to do what I told you to do, I've got some grace for that. I'll help you with that. I'll give you strength. I'll give you words. I'll, I'll give you compassion. I'll transform your heart towards your neighbors. You will receive grace for loving your neighbors because God is glorified when... We love our neighbors. And so he's going to empower you to do that because our love for God is incomplete without loving our neighbor. 
I want to share just a couple of quick stories that uh, people have already shared with me in regards to neighboring. Uh, Bob and Mary Arn have lived in their house for years, and they, and they know many of their neighbors' names. Uh, but they decided, they were challenged by this uh, new theme, and they decided to be more intentional. So they've scheduled here in a week or two uh, what's called the cul-de-sac coffee date. And they've invited all their neighbors in the cul-de-sac to come to their house for coffee, cake, and coffee. And they can't say that really fast. But uh, it is a non-threatening opportunity to get to know one another better and just to catch up with their neighbors. Uh, Gina Crossley, right after the theme was announced, she had a neighbor call her for a visit. And the neighbor had experienced lots of losses in the last year and just needed some encouragement. And so Gina, who was already neighboring, right, the neighbor already knew her and knew that she could uh, ask for a visit. Uh, but she was able to do that. And she was able to invite her to her small group that night that was starting on a book that she thought would be helpful for her neighbor. And the neighbor said yes. Like those are just small things. But I want you to understand this. Small steps can do amazing things. Right? Sometimes we think like it's got to be big, just small. In fact, when you think about what can obeying this part of the great commandment look like, I think one of the best examples, and we see it in the life of Jesus over and over, is something that one author called a plus one. So imagine that you have a thousand little hash marks uh, between like not knowing someone at all and knowing them fully and completely, better than they know themselves, all right? So you had all these hash marks. A plus one is any positive interaction you have with them in any way that moves you one spot. Like you've just taken one little step. You did one positive interaction. Uh, you asked them if you could borrow a ladder. Actually, even them doing something for you could be very positive. Uh, you don't want the other person to feel like you're on a one-sided relationship where they're, they're, you're, they're always getting help or whatever. So it's good. That's good. Uh, but any positive interaction moves you just one little spot. And Jesus had lots of, uh, in fact, countless number of plus ones in his ministry. Uh, he asked someone for a drink of water. He asked this woman at the well for a drink of water. He attended a wedding. Uh, he was the guest at someone's house. He grieved with friends. He told stories, even jokes. Uh, he went fishing, and uh, he was pretty good at it. Uh, in fact, he made breakfast on the beach after he, after he caught the fish. He, he made breakfast on the beach, and they sat around a fire pit. He had a fish fry. It's probably a Friday. And so he had fish fry on the beach around a fire pit, I mean, he knew what to do. Uh, he called them by their name. And he shared his life. He says, I no longer call you servants, but friends. And even during the worst moment of his life, he blessed his neighbor on the cross and talked to them and gave them hope and told them that they would be with him today. Which I think drives home the point that our love for God is incomplete without loving our neighbor. So my challenge for you today, and you have the card on, uh, on your seat, among everything else, is this card that just says simply bless. My challenge for you is I want us to bless our neighbors in 2019. And bless is an acrostic. Uh, the B stands for begin with prayer. Like even if you don't know their name yet, start, start there. Like I pray for the people that live in that house. I pray, God, that you would bless them. If they don't have a relationship with you, God, I pray that you would draw them. Uh, whatever's going on in their life, Lord, you know what it is. I pray that you would minister to them, that you'd make yourself real to them, that they would grow uh, this year. God, I pray for this neighbor over here. I pray that, God, I notice that they're, uh, they've been arguing a little bit. I hear them. Uh, God, I pray that you would just restore and renew. And we just begin to pray for these neighbors, specifically targeting these eight closest neighbors. So we begin with prayer. The L, which we've already covered, is learn, your, learn their names. Uh, use the card on your fridge that we passed out. Again, there's more out in the foyer. Uh, e, engage in conversation. Like, just shoot the breeze. Just talk to them. Uh, after you get to know their name, engage in conversations and do it over and over again. Make sure they know you're a safe person for them to talk to. E, engage in conversation. Take the step. S, seek to be intentional. Just look for opportunities. Uh, it snows, you know, clear out their, uh, the entryway to their driveway or do their sidewalks or, you know, those kinds of things. Just begin, just engage, just begin to seek to be intentional. And the last S is share your stories. Uh, you know, that's something that just as you get to know them, that doesn't mean you do that the first time you talk to them, 
But as you're getting to know them, uh, part of that is wanting to hear their story. Like, where are they from? What have they done? And when they turn around, they ask you and you share your story, don't leave out Jesus. Like, if you have a Jesus story, that's a huge part of your story. And so to, to deny him by, by leaving him out of your story is no, no gift to anyone. And so uh, share your story. And then also, as part of that S, is share your story with us. We want to hear stories about neighboring. And so there's a spot on our website when you click on neighboring that gives you a place to share stories and ideas. So remember, our love for God is incomplete without loving our neighbor. Now I want to wrap up uh, this series. I want you to think back at the very beginning as we looked at the Good Samaritan, that the, the religious e leader asked this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? He was looking for a law, a rule to follow, but Jesus' answer gave him a love to lead. He didn't answer it the way that the guy asked. He asked the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus answered with a story that didn't answer that question. The story of the Good Samaritan did not answer the question of who is my neighbor. It answered the question, who is a neighbor? At the end of the story, Jesus didn't ask him, and so who is a neighbor to the man? He ended the story by saying, who was a neighbor to the man? Jesus cares about how we react. He wants us to be a neighbor. But let's start with our literal neighbors. So I want to challenge you to take, take up this challenge in 2019 and beyond. This theme isn't a one-year theme. It's to, meant to be a paradigm shift for the way that we live our lives for the rest of our lives. But in, in researching and studying, I came across this thought that really challenged me. And it was the idea of what is the most underutilized resource that we have in the kingdom of God. And the author said, and I agree, he said, it's, it's your home. Your home is the most underutilized underutilized resource in the kingdom of God. And I want you to think about it in this term. So our church building is about 35,000 square feet. We are leasing or renting about 15,000 square feet, give or take, at the Oconomowoc campus uh, for us to have services in. So between the two campuses, we have about 50,000 square feet of meeting space. Uh, if we were to look we have more than this, but if we were to look, just for easy math, if we were to look at 500 homes uh, represented in this house, you know, households represented in our church, uh, we have almost 600 households represented, but just looking at the households, if we were to look at just 500, and, and we were to say, let's say each home was 2,000 square feet, some are much bigger, some are smaller, but if we were to just average it out at 2,000 square feet, that is a million square feet of space. That is 20 times larger than our two campuses combined. And instead of one church kitchen, we would have 500 kitchens and kitchen tables that ministry can happen around. So my question is, what could happen in Waukesha and Oconomowoc if we made all of our kitchens, back porches, decks, grills, garages, and tools available for his use? What could happen? Let's find out. Let's find out. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for the things that you've done in our lives. And God, I thank you for what you're gonna do in the lives of our neighbors as we simply get to know them and we let the love of God that is in our hearts flow through us towards them. I'm excited to see what you're gonna do. And I just pray a blessing upon each person as we put it into practice and we neighbor, and we neighbor well. Lord, in Jesus' name.